for the people who are on, I'd love to invite you to join me and um, turn on your videos if you would. So I can say hello. Good morning. Um, for those of you who are here um, online, uh, I'm Linda Freed, and I'd like to invite you to uh, put your video on and um, we can begin a conversation. Good morning. Good morning, Linda. Nice to see you. Welcome. Uh, we'll wait for um, others to turn their videos on and then we can get going. But um, maybe you can introduce yourselves. Yeah, hi, I'm Sachin Panda. I'm a professor at the Salk Institute. I work on circadian rhythms and uh, one aspect of uh, rhythms that we are studying is uh, time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting that is being used extensively throughout the world. But we do the basic science research in mice, flies, and sometimes non-human primates. Very exciting. Um, welcome. And uh, uh, Eric Fung, would you introduce yourself? Hi, um, I'm Eric. I'm a cardiologist at the uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, I uh, work on heart failure and frailty, and I've read uh, a lot of your papers, uh, Dr. Freight. Um, very nice to meet everybody here. A pleasure. Um, I see Jessica Covington, who's at the National Academy of Medicine. Jessica, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> pleasure. And uh, there's one other person on the line, um, Vijaya Srinivas. Are, are you able to join us by video? Thank you very much. Good morning to all. Uh, my name is Dr. Vijaya Srinivas. I am a medical doctor and researcher from India, Karnataka State, Mysore. My organization is Public Health Research Institute of India, related to women's health as well as cervical cancer result uh, screening program. We are the pioneer to start cervical cancer screening program about 10 years back in our place. And uh, at present, we are um, doing uh, uh, yoga for healthy aging, that is, which reduces multimorbidity in seniors. This is a catalyst award we received from National Institute of Aging last year, 2019. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, um, Jessica, I, I, uh, <laughs> I like your cat. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I have a feeling we, we could get going. Is that correct? I think so, because uh, I had a discussion session that just ended and we had four or five people. So okay. <laughs> it seems like this so, is the code. Yeah, I think we're at the tail end of the whole week. And <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm delighted to meet with all of you. And, and I'm, I'm really here to uh, try and be useful. Um, each of you are clearly well along in your career. So I um, and, and, and accomplishing great things. So. You know, I was told that I should um, tell you about my own career, but I'd love to know first, if I could, what, what if anything, you'd be interested to know about that so I can, um, so I can try and be useful. Um, Sachin, anything particularly on your mind? Well, I would like to hear about your career, and uh, you have uh, accomplished a lot, and you have put focus on frailty as a global uh, issue and which I completely agree with because you know to be 
in peak human performance at any given age is a universal human aspiration and human right. And as basic researcher and clinicians, um, our job is to figure out how to promote that foundation of health. <laughs> because if people are not physically active, then... Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more, obviously. Um, yeah, but thank you. Uh, that's inspiring. Uh, Eric, anything in particular you're interested in, in thinking about together? Um, yeah, and uh, just wondering, um, you know, of course, you've contributed hugely to the definition of frailty and, and over the years uh, um, applied it in, you know, uh, quite broadly. I just, just wondering, you know, what's, uh, if you're still working on frailty and, and you know, what direction uh, you plan to take from here onwards? Thank you. And Vijaya, any, anything in particular um, that you would like us to think about together? Yeah, you know, I'm uh, just uh, uh, interested to listen, observe. Okay, well, hopefully you'll, you'll all leap in. And uh, I'm happy to tell, to meet Dr. Um, Sachin Pandey uh, as I'm following this intermittent uh, um, uh, posting since two years, but I did not know about him. I just started uh, doing the intermittent fasting for the past two years, and uh, I am finding very good in that. Very good. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try and get us started, and then I'm actually happy to uh, talk about basically anything that would be useful. Uh, so uh, just to tell you a little bit about my own background, I'm, I'm currently, since 2008, the Dean at Columbia University's School of Public Health. Um, and I made a, a major career transition to do this uh, out of the School of Medicine at Johns Hopkins, where I was the Chief of Geriatric Medicine and directed the Center of Excellence for Aging Research, uh, which I had founded, um, which spanned the schools of medicine, public health, and nursing. For the Center on Aging and Health. And I had, I, I think over the course of my, my own career, um, been able to really build a, a, a substantial enterprise towards the goals that Dr. Panda just said, which is that I, um, the, the, to me, the, the thing that got me into this field in the first place, because I wasn't planning to do it, <laughs> was uh, when I was a new faculty member, having just finished, um, a young new faculty member, having finished uh, my medical training uh, as an internist, uh, residency, fellowship, <laughs> uh, fellowship in general internal medicine, gotten an MPH, uh, because I, I got very excited about prevention research, did a cardiovascular epi fellowship, I then one day uh, and had started on the faculty working in cardiovascular disease prevention. And um, one day the new chief of geriatric medicine who I knew walked in and told me I should be a geriatrician. And I told him, forget it. I'm not interested. I'm really excited about what I'm doing. Um, and it doesn't interest me. And then, um, he left, but I, I respected him very much. So I went home that night and I started looking at the data and it blew me away. I, I just had never thought about it. This was the, um, this was about 1985, 80, maybe 86, 87. And we were in, in the middle of an AIDS pandemic and all of our hospitals were flooded with AIDS patients. And I looked at the data, uh, you know, that said that, you know, that described what we had achieved in adding 30 years to human life expectancy. As, as societies, it was societal investment that did it. Uh, it's astonishing. Uh, welcome, Jen. And, um, and, and it blew me away. And then I realized that when I looked in the newspapers, all the headlines were saying, we can't afford all these old people. And, and there was this big contrast between this immense human achievement of having lengthened human life, 
Welcome, Vijay. Nice to see you. Um, uh, um, but we, we didn't, it had never before happened in history. And we were hanging crepe on it and saying that this was a, a disaster that was going to kill us. And I thought, this doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and it seems like this is going to be the AIDS issue of the 21st century, how we actually transition successfully to walk our lives. So um, honestly, the next day I changed my career. <laughs> I went back and did my clinical geriatric stream. Um, but it was those data that line up, Sachin, with what you were saying, you know, which is that we have learned so much. I'm pleased that I've been able to contribute to it. I think I'm sure all of you are doing the same. Uh, you know, that has told us all, all, uh, what the possibilities are to actually do the next step in the 21st century, which is, first of all, to preserve our longer lives in the face of a lot of threats, but also to now figure out how to make it so people are living longer lives with health. Um, we know a lot about how to accomplish that. We don't know everything we need to know, um, but I, to me, that is the challenge for the 21st century in terms of human health, along with mitigating climate change. Um, and so that's what got me into this career. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't planning to do it, but um, it wasn't in my sights. Um, um, Jen, I, I don't know, you wanna introduce yourself? Um, others had a chance to do so. Yes, sorry, I was having problems getting into the room. I um, understand. <laughs> my name is Jen Nodal. I am a, I have a background in geriatrics and hospice care, and I am currently launching a uh, coaching business for patient self-advocacy, teaching uh, patients to advocate for themselves in healthcare. So. Fabulous. Good. Um, so... I'm not sure really what to tell you about my career, right? except to say that my, I, I, I feel very blessed in the career we're all in, uh, clearly listening to each of you, that we have the opportunity to unite uh, medicine, public health, with aspirations to actually use science and knowledge creation to make a difference in human health and in individuals and the health of populations. Um, and, and to actually extend through all of this the opportunity for everybody to have long lives with health. So that's, to me, um, I, I don't know if I knew this when I was just starting out, but where I am now, it has increasingly felt like a privilege to be able to work on things that are so deeply altruistic uh, and, and get paid for it. That's kind of amazing. Um, but, but, you know, along the way, I have, you know, I've progressed through an academic career, um, like, all, like, like all careers. It, it, if you look at um, what I've accomplished, you might infer that it was a straight progressive lineup. Well, the truth is the opposite. <laughs> no career, really, I don't think is really like that, or very few. You know, it has lots of ups and downs, and maybe if you draw a straight line through it, if you're lucky, it looks like an upward slope. Um, but you know, and the and the down periods when your grant is rejected, when your papers turned down, when the path you were going on turns out to be a dead end, uh, when you you're just not figuring something out that is that is really critical. Um, all of those are, I think, um, the moments when you learn the most, or at least that's my, been my experience, uh, and when you also need others to encourage you that you shouldn't give up. I don't give up very easily. Right? That helps. But, <laughs> but um, I, I think, you know, for, I, I've worked um, over the course of my career as a clinician as a geriatric physician uh, for many years. I, I headed a division of geriatric medicine at Johns Hopkins and, led, uh, and, and where we really had 
have developed a, a really coordinated continuum of geriatric care models, uh, which I think are, are superb, but, but always, and, and provide a model of how to deliver the kind of care that an aging population can benefit from. But, um, and I've been able to, um, it's a blessing of being at this for a while to evolve all through my career, work on, on many of the major health outcomes associated with aging that we have to understand in order to figure out how to create health span and particularly um, both how to prevent the onset of these conditions and treat and, and mitigate them. Um, you know, Jen, the things that you're working on are critically important in all of that. Um, and so when I just said this, it sounds like I'm talking about the intrinsic factors going on in the human body exclusively and I'm not because many, in most cases, the, how people do in terms of their health or illness is uh, contextually modified hugely. Um, I guess the, the other thing I could reflect on is, you know, having, having started out working actually on cardiovascular disease prevention um, and thinking a lot about chronic diseases and aging, I, I've evolved, I, I, could, I always think about them, but I realized over time that there were many other things that, that chronic diseases, A, we learned were pre many of them are preventable. Um, and uh, that was a major breakthrough over the last few decades. Um, you know, at this point, we know that about 50% of the major age-related chronic diseases are preventable. We're not doing it, <laughs> but we know it. Um, and then I, you know, I started thinking about some of the health outcomes of chronic diseases, and particularly, uh, I, had, I had a little background that led me to think about disability and function. Diseases affect disability and function, and, and really that it was what how whether people had the ability to function in their daily lives that they most valued. Um, that was most important to them to do the things that uh, to quote the World Health Organization that they that they value, um, and and thought a lot and worked a lot on on prevention of disability, as well as trying to understand how it progresses and the roles of multimorbidity and disability. And, uh, and, and studying both of those as a clinician, I started to think about frailty because in geriatric medicine, frailty is described as the, well, the raison d'etre of geriatric medicine. But when, when I started out, <laughs> um, I actually, founded a geriatric assessment center. The goal of geriatric assessment is to care for frail old adults. But at that time, while I thought what we did with a multidisciplinary team of clinicians was really effective, but all the randomized trials were coming out with negative findings, um, which perplexed me. And mm -hmm. it didn't help me either. <laughs> I'm certainly not argued for a, a fairly expensive care modality. So I started trying to think about how I would define frailty. And you know, it was very clear to me that there was a subset of patients who were quite vulnerable, were not marked by a particular chronic disease, seemed to have an aging related progression that was not disease specific. And, and you know, at 50 yards, you could kind of suss out looking at the patient that this person felt frail. Um, that's that's a very different than thinking about a, a specific chronic disease or multimorbidity or disability. Um, so, and, and I realized that basically the definitions that were being used at the time were a real grab bag of all of the above. <laughs> they were really old, they had a lot of disease, They they were disabled in particular, they were disabled in activities of daily living. Those were the definitions and the randomized trials were just putting all that in one pot and saying, if you have any of this, you might benefit from what we do and it wasn't showing results. 
So I actually um, did a large number of studies, which no one would ever publish. Um, to tell you the truth, I got constant rejection letters that nobody was interested in frailty, but I did a lot of studies to try and probe what was going on. Studies with my patients, surveys of geriatricians to see what they thought. Um, uh, and it just seemed increasingly important to me to try and name what was going on and that it was not the foreground of what clinicians evaluate which is somebody comes in with a chief complaint that they're short of breath, right? <laughs> and you diagnose the, the chronic, the disease that's causing it, but there was something going on in the substrate of the person that was distinct from that. And so I spent many years trying to figure this out. Uh, actually eight years, one day a week, trying to understand the literature, trying to go through the process of understanding everything everybody knew, asking older people if they had ever seen anybody who was frail. And, and you know, because geriatricians give lots of talks in, in long-term care facilities. <laughs> um, and every older adult would raise their hand and say, yes, they'd seen someone who was frail. And then I, I, would, I would always ask them, well, how do you know they're frail? And they'd say, well, they're really thin, they're slow, they're tired, they're losing weight, they're weak, some combination of all those. I, that's what I always heard. And that matched my clinical instinct also. But it took me years to come to a hypothesis about why those, that list was on the same page. Um, and and, the, and I, I mean, literally, I spent eight years trying to figure that out. Um, and, uh, and then one day, you know, you all are innovators. So I'll just say one day after all that work, I could see what the, what I thought the hypothesis was, um, which is that we have a problem of a very vicious cycle of, of energy dysregulation, which is manifesting in the things that older adults and clinicians recognize as, as, as markers, visible clinical markers of this frail. The five things I said, actually each are associated in a causal way with the others. And they make a very vicious cycle. And, and the entry point is that any of them kicked off I, we now see by a core biologic process, um, but also potentially kicked off by inflammatory chronic diseases. And, and that vicious cycle turns into a very downward spiral, which we've shown, um, so that people who have advanced frailty are at very high risk of dying. And probably not, uh, very resolved, supportable, but may not be resolvable. And, and we've gone on, just to answer your question, I still do work in this area. We published, a, I published a synthesis article um, this year in Nature, in the inaugural issue of Nature Aging, about what we think is the evidence that the biology underlying this pre clinical presentation has to do with the uh, really the dysregulation of a complex dynamical adaptive system that maintains homeostasis in our body and is the basis for either resilience or if it gets dysregulated too much, the whole or our whole human organism falls to a lower state of function, which is being frail and the stigmata of being frail emerge. So um, I, I think working on all the different health outcomes of aging helped me think about how to tease them apart, right? Nothing's ever wasted, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Even your dead ends aren't wasted. Um, I, I hope that gives you a, a, a sense of my career. I think the thing I haven't mentioned is that I moved, uh, why I moved well, two things, maybe. I, th I think I just tried to describe the process I've figured out for innovation, uh, which I've done on, on a number of things. 
you know, the deep interrogation of something you think really matters. Uh, trying to learn everything you can and then trying to figure out what the missing piece is. And uh, I was, am inspired by Michelangelo who said that um, sculpting is merely the act of revealing the figure that's in the stone. As a, as a scientist, I think that's exactly what we do. We develop a hypothesis of what we think is a, is the right answer of what we think is the right answer on an important problem, and that hypothesis is what we think the truth may be, um, what the figure in the stone may be, and then we have to develop the tools to reveal it and test it if, if it's really true. Um, and 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 so that process of innovation. And with the definition of innovation as creativity with a purpose, um, is, is um, one of, of really figuring out the most important thing and then trying to chip away to find what you think the truth is. Now, looking at all of you, I bet you do the same thing. So I doubt I'm telling you anything you didn't know. Um, but just to tell you what I've done. The other thing I did, um, I'll just, just to end for the moment, is uh, I, I do care about and have always cared a lot about using knowledge to improve our world. And I, I, I believe as an academic, that's my, and a scientist, that's my responsibility. Uh, and anybody who's paid by the, uh, a governmental uh, source of research or, or program funding uh, is basically being invested in by the public to make that difference to, to advancing knowledge. Um, but um, I, I, um, I was trained in public health science and population science as an epidemiologist. And um, 13 years ago, I moved to a school of public health because I was very concerned that um, all of the knowledge we've created needs to be transformed into advancing, like extending health span. And that that, and, and delivering that on the population level. And so uh, I've spent a, a lot of time trying to accomplish that. And, and so issues of how we create health span, how we protect people's vulnerabilities and meet their needs are neither fully <laughs> embedded in medicine in the U.S. nor in public health. I, uh, uh, you know, I work with many uh, wonderful Indian colleagues, and so you know, uh, uh, I know that in many ways you all are working on these issues quite a lot as well. Um, but how we actually use the science to transform health futures for everybody is really critical. So I'll stop there. I don't usually talk about myself this much, but it was my assignment. So I hope that it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'd like to welcome the two people who have joined us, Catherine and Amy, welcome. Please um, hope you can join us on the video as well as um, um, listening. And uh, if you can, please introduce yourselves and then I'd love to have a conversation. They may not be fully here yet. So um, I, my guess, I'd be interested in knowing what drew each of you to this National Academy of Medicine process and event and the kinds of things that are on your mind, particularly around the issues of science and, and knowledge creation and innovation and healthy longevity. Yeah, so I was uh, invited to lead a session, so that's how <laughs> I got into it. But I've been following uh, many monographs from national academies, um, both medicine and science. So that's how I'm aware of all these initiatives that are uh, driven by both the institutes. Mm -hmm. um, what I see uh, means, uh, what I see is if we want to create a culture of health, then we got to empower everyone 
and uh, enlighten everyone. So that means they have to be they have to be taught or they have to get the information about um, the scientific basis for good healthy lifestyle. Or even if we even if they have to take a supplement, calcium supplement or something else, they have to be. They have to know the science behind it so that they have trust in it. And second is the opportunity to practice it. So for example, if we say that exercise is good for you, but if we create um, buildings and cities where people cannot walk, then we cannot create a culture of health. So in this way, public health has become a fertile ground for innovation and also challenging because um, this is where architects, city planners, scientists, and the individual who has to act on it, uh, they're given many confusing, confounding information. And uh, in this healthy longevity, um, the whole exercise that we're doing, I was surprised that we don't have any city planners. We do, because if we think about- we Don't have any what? architects and city planners or building planners because on a daily basis, we don't expect 300 million people to get on treadmill in a gym or buy Peloton and do exercise. Most of the physical activities will come from our daily activities. And uh, this is also one case where our infrastructure development and our physical uh, and our healthy goals collide because the definition of infrastructure is to move people, product, information, uh, food, and waste from one place to another place with minimum human physical activity. So, so yeah, yeah, so I totally um, agree with you that if if the goal is to create healthy longevity, we have to take a, a much bigger, adopt a much bigger frame with really transitions across every sector of society, right? to use the science, to use what we now know. And, and probably, as you pointed out, just changing one sector, like writing a prescription to a patient to get more exercise, will never work if there's no place to exercise. Yeah. So, so all, all sectors of society really need to be in alignment around shared goals. Totally agree with you. Yeah. Um, you know, I, there are other, a million other environmental dimensions of this, thinking about Vijaya working on um, cancer um, screening and prevention. You know, we, we know that the rise in industrial agriculture is leading to a huge amount of pesticide use, which, which is thought to be um, causative of some of the rise in cancer. In India and other regions, is that a fair statement? Right? And if if true, then we have to think of many dimensions of the environment that are are threatening our our health. Um, I don't know if you want to correct me, Vijay. On that. No, it's true. I mean the environmental pollutions. Um, come in many forms too, um, starting from the garments we wear and then the kind of flame retardants that are in our household uh, that we come in constant contact with. Um, for example, I work with um, firefighters and for example, San Diego Fire, Firefighter, San Diego Fire Department has 750 firefighters. And over the last two years, 32 of them are diagnosed with cancer. And then the question is, they know that it's unusually high number, but at the same time, they understand that the modern buildings are built with many different components, which are unnatural, and they have fire retardants and other stuff. So when a building burns and they get into it, they don't know what type of chemicals they're exposed to. Even the manufacturers do not know if you burn that component, what kind of fume, what kind of toxins will come out. And similarly, in, in California, we have a lot of wildfire. And when wildfire burn, we think that it's only the plants that are burning, but there are also the human man-made structures that burn. And that fume is spread all over the means. 
San Francisco and Sacramento get blanketed with <laughs> this stuff. So that's another uh, aspect that we are surrounded by a built environment in which a lot of products are being used and those are not rigorously tested for um, endocrine disruption or carcinogenicity and a lot of stuff. So Amy, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming on the video. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. I'm Amy Moore. I'm joining from Michigan and I've worked in public health for 30 years. Um, one of the curiosities I've been working on in my head for a while is what we know um, from, in my experience in public health, is there's that tipping point at age 45. So, you know, we have all of these, you know, males that are driving crazy when they're, you know, 16 to 26 and all these destructive behaviors. But what we notice is at age 45, people are either running their first marathon or having their first heart attack. And so I really feel like we should have like some kind of welcome to adulthood or some kind of an option to transition at age 45 when people have a little more sense in their head, you know, they might think this, is this the only trajectory I have? So that's my, that's my comment and my curiosity. Anybody have any reactions to that? Maybe that's, that's a pretty awesome comment that you made and a few years ago, uh, when I was attending my uh, daughter's middle school graduation or something like that, and then I was surrounded by this 45-year-old, actually, I was 45 by then. And then. One thing that struck me is there are so many parents who looked sick, either they were obese or they were on medication. So then I thought, well, you know, there are all these... Um, what is that? All these challenges going on in different uh, field of science. So, for example, we had the what cold shower or ice bucket challenge or something like that. Then we thought, why can't we have a challenge that by the time your first kid graduates from high school, you should be free of any medication to treat a chronic condition. So, can you reach fifty without medication? I love and that can be a pretty cool challenge. So maybe that should be one public health movement or some initiative, very simple. Try to reach 50 without chronic, without medication for chronic disease. What's your reaction to that, Amy? Working in public, I was at one of the first um, federally qualified health centers as well. And the, that's one of the places that I had worked. And so, um, I, I, I think we would really need to help people figure out what kind of skills they needed to have. I mean, we really have to retool um, people's capacity and their access to that. They just really have no idea. I mean, healthy eating, I mean, these are people eating donuts for breakfast and, you know, <laughs> I'm like going raw vegan and I'm thinking, how do we you know, get that trajectory changed. How do we, how do we help people that have been smoking cigarettes, driving fast, doing drugs? You know, there's people I know that don't take jobs because they have to pass a drug test and they smoke weed every day, right? These are truck, you know, people that can drive a truck, but they can't drive a fuel truck because they're not willing to do that. They're not willing to quit addictive substances. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people that really are broken and hurt and have a real hole in their soul. Um, so I, I don't know. I just think at age 45, if there's some way we could, we could help guide, I think it would need to be a real hand, hand holding experience for them. So Sachin, and you have said two things. One is that people need individual support and they also need contextual um, modifications that make the healthy choices, the easy choices, right? The principle, yeah. One of the principles of public health. Um, and any other responses to that? Jen, you look like you wanted to say something. Um, first, I say this is a fantastic presentation. So thank you so much for all of the knowledge. Um, I do have to say also that, you know, so my, uh, you know, my platform is 
patient uh, health self-advocacy. So, and my big thing is health looks different to everyone. And Amy, I completely agree, you know, the drugs and the, like all those modifiables are huge. And yes, such and like the goal would be for nobody to be on medication by the time they reach 50. But I think also we have to be mindful that there's also that non-modifiables that people don't have control over. Um, and that's actually like one of the reasons that I started doing what I'm doing. Optimal health looks different to everybody and not everybody has control over, you know, that's one of the reasons that I started my company. I'm a nurse practitioner as well as a patient. You know, I'm a two-time cancer survivor. I have um, a condition for which I can't, it's unavoidable for me to, you know, there's medications I have to take in order to live. So to say that um, that's the only picture of health it's, uh, it's kind of to say those op, like absolutes, it's a little gray, you know? I think that there's, um, for some people, it's, it's a huge accomplishment to be able to have a normal life with medications, you know? And I also am vegan and yet that's not, you know, I thought being vegan was the solution to everything, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, unfortunately, it's not for everybody. So yeah. Yeah. I just want everyone to keep that in mind that being your own self-advocate is, is helping people to understand that and helping your providers to understand that and being able to say, you know what, these are my goals and this is what's best for me. So yeah. that's kind of I fully understand and I agree with you. Um, and in fact, people who have pre-existing condition or who are on medication for chronic disease they actually need to be even more mindful about their um, three foundations of health, that sleep, physical activity, and nutrition. And the way, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> the, if, uh, I may take the liberty of sharing just one slide, the way we advise people to use the knowledge of circadian rhythm, uh, we say that try to be in bed for eight hours so that you can potentially get seven hours of restful sleep. Try to avoid eating for the first one or two hours after waking up because that's when our melatonin is dropping, cortisol is rising, and there are many basic science papers showing that that's not good. And then after the first calorie, eat for eight, 10, 11, or maximum 12 hours, depending on how is your lifestyle. Try to avoid food and avoid bright light for two to three hours before going to bed, so that helps you sleep well. And then during the daytime, go outside, get some daylight for 30 minutes because light is the best antidepressant. It's plentiful and free. You just have to step outside and have 30 minutes of walk. And that's what we say. Uh, we have a research app called My Circadian Clock. So that's how people get the information. And we use this framework in many chronic disease uh, treatment where people already have medications. And we do monitor the medications and adjust them if needed. So this is what we feel. This is something that everybody can adopt. We don't say that people have to go to bed at 10 o'clock. That's why I don't have any time. <laughs> Thank you. That's really valuable. So one of the things we're doing. That is. Thank you for sharing. One of the things I think uh, everybody's speaking to um, is, is trying to grasp what, what, we're reaching for in terms of health and health span, right? And um, I think that uh, going to a question Erickson asked before, thank you. you know, what, what's the next generation of frailty research? I think it's to understand, um, in addition to how to prevent and treat and delay frailty and, and appropriately care for people who have ex severe frailty. It's to understand it's converse, which has to do with both resilience and health. Uh, and uh, what falls apart that actually in the falling apart emerges as frailty. 